This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. Hello everyone, I'm Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs and host of Vegas Rock Dog Radio. On today's show, I'm talking about foxes, bees, goats and more, so stay right there. the host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs, and you are listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. We're a rock and roll show that's all about pets, people, and pop culture. How is everyone doing? Hello, Jim. How are you? Hello. Very good. Uh, I got Tina here. She's very needy right now. For some reason, she is not sure why we're starting the show. So here are my co-hosts. I have, her name's not Tina. It's Miss Thornton, but we call it Tina. That's her nickname. And we have Mr. Twix in the studio and Miss Galaxy looks down on us from the Rainbow Bridge to make sure we give you a good show every single week. And of course, we've got Jim here in studio as well. So if you are new to the show, let's do a little... Um, you know, how people can connect us, and then we'll do a little update on us. Um, give them all your platforms. I'll give them all, all, all of my platforms. Here we go. Uh, our website is vegasrockdogradio.com, and you'll find us on Periscope, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, and Instagram. We have a blog, therockandrolldog.com, and you can find the show on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spoke by SiriusXM, and plenty of other platforms. Whatever app you choose to use, you will find us. Just search Vegas Rock Dog Radio. And we also have a, a mini show called, uh, what is it called? <laughs> Tip of the Week. <laughs> tip of the Week. And also you can find that on, on iTunes as well. It's just a quick tip. Uh, tip for... of the Week, Bubble and Squeak. Oh, there you go. Uh, you, have you ever eaten Bubble and Squeak? I don't think so. I've heard you talk about it, though. Yeah, it's basically your leftovers. You throw them all in a frying pan and crispen them up, as Jim likes to say. Crispen them up. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but yeah, that's where you'll find Tip of the Week. And um, let's do a little update. Let's do a little update. Well, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, well, is it the middle? Is it the end? No idea, really. But uh, things are very different right now. Slowly but surely, we are coming back to normal. We're based in Las Vegas and we are getting close to phase three. We're very excited about that. Uh, it's uh, it's good for our city to be up and running. And um it's good for pets because now they can all go back to their daycares and their doggy indoor dog parks and, and that kind of stuff. I'm wondering if, if people's pets, Jim, are just um, sick of seeing, seeing their pet parents. <laughs> My, mine aren't. They love it. And they love going for their W A L K S. I have to spell it because they're here. That's right. That's exactly what you have to and do. And they've got extra W A L K S's in, and they're probably going to get another one today after the show. Yeah, once it, it cools down a little bit, mm-hmm. it's it's we're we're pretty warm at the moment. But yeah, I'm wondering if you know pets are going really. You know, you go back to work, or please drop me off at daycare. That's something you do need to consider, though, because now they've got so used to everybody being at home that. Uh, you know, they, what are they going to, how are they going to react once you go back to work? So that's that's uh, something we're going to cover in, in a future show in the not too distant future because it is definitely something to consider. You've got to make sure that they feel secure with you leaving. 
And there are lots and lots of ways in which you can do that. So, uh, yeah, so we're in the middle of a, of a pandemic. And um, there's been a lot of fear mongering and uh, awful, awful just for headlines and clicks and, and revenue. Um, where, and as you know, if you listen to the show, we like to make sure we are factual in everything that we do. So it, it's quite frustrating, actually, to see these uh, scary headlines. Dog gets Corona. Pets do have their own version of Corona. And to, to date, there's been no evidence that they can get it from a human or can they pass it on to a human. Now, here's the thing. Think about this, though. Go, yes, but they, they swabbed a dog and they found it on the dog. Well, if you've got Corona and you cough on your dog or your cat, you pet them, yeah, you're going to find it on them. But that doesn't mean that they've contracted it at this point. That seems to be where we are at as far as the COVID-19. And Corona is the umbrella name because there are other um, COVIDs. Um, but that's another thing that we will we will cover. I've reached out to many organizations uh, to find out about, about Corona and pets and people. And at this point, it is not uh, known to be zoonotic, so it can't pass along. Um, What's that word? Zoonotic. Zoonotic. I yeah. never heard of Sounds that. Sounds like word. hypnotic. Zoo, like Z O O. Mm-hmm. I never heard that yeah. before. So I did. I've, I've, re- I've reached out to um, one of the main labs in the United States. Actually, they're all over the world. And I actually said to them, "Have you tested <laughs> any pets that have had human, the human COVID?" And they said, "No." And they did thousands and thousands of tests. So, um, but we will follow up. I, I at this point, I, I think with most. Uh, most places having uh, got to the peak and we start to come down, we haven't seen uh, anything else with pets. But uh, just know this, a lot of these uh, media outlets, <laughs> they love to make money off those headlines and at the, at the same time frighten people to death. And there have been cases of people wanting to uh, get rid of the pets and in, in some uh, countries actually killing them. And that's, that's why I think we get so outraged about it, you know, because it, it leads on to something um, that's unnecessary. But we will cover anything that comes up. I keep checking um, with all my sources. And um, so that's good. Very, very happy about that, that uh, we haven't seen that happening. Um, you finally got out to play again. Yeah, I'm just uh, finishing up uh, one more week will be six weeks of virtual concerts we've been playing, which yeah. is, you know, we're on a big, huge live outdoor stage with no audience. <laughs> 8,000 empty seats. Playing into our ears and then broadcasting it. And uh, what? That's what? it? That's the end of your story? No, it's been fun. I'm glad we're playing. I mean, my goodness, I think we might be the only band that's playing in the whole country right now. Probably, probably. You know. And um, what they do is a four-camera shoot live straight onto Facebook. And uh, Frankie, who's, who's, whose show it is, um, he interacts with everybody. Frankie Marino. Yeah, he um, interacts with everyone through through an iPad, the fans, and they love it, absolutely love it. So it looks like, though, eventually once they allow audience members, that, I think that'll the, be a yeah, nice venue. Yeah, the venue, venue want, really wants us to be there uh, on a regular basis, and it's sponsored by the city of North Las Vegas. Oh, it's is it? the Craig Ranch Regional Park. Very it's, nice. It's, it's an amazing park. It looks fantastic. Venue. It really is it's just a little bit of a drive for me, but besides that. Yeah, that's so that's cool. good. That's good news. And I also came out with a series of notebooks, and uh, they're all bee themed. You know, so we've got uh, Be Grateful, uh, Save the Bees. I think there's four or five designs, and uh, you can uh, purchase those by just uh, going to our website, vegasrockdogradio.com, and you'll see the link for the, the notebooks. And I often share them through our social media as well. So that's pretty much our update so i said it's up the show we're going to talk about um all kinds of animals actually foxes bees goats and um let's start with goats so goats help raise thousands for landundo hospice you're making up words no again. that's it's in wales Landundo. it's welsh Landundo. Clandundo. Clandundo. no it's not clan it's one of those Clandundo. there's no c there's two L's. <laughs> 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 
for you. Just weird. <laughs> Anyway, the curious goats had been spotted eating flowers and hedges in people's gardens. So this this herd of wild goats, they just showed up in the town on empty streets at the start of this lockdown and uh, have inadvertently helped raise more than £50,000 for a hospice. So in March, the Kashmiri goats became the sensation when this video popped up of them munching around on people's gardens in North Wales um, of Hlandundo. And if you're Welsh, please forgive that pronunciation. Anyway, the town's St. David's Hospice has now sold almost 3,000 shirts and 500 tote bags featuring the images of these goats. And it's, uh, it's been facing a funding crisis after cancelling its, its normal fundraising. So, um, you know, it was just uh, no guests, just, just goats at the hotel where they, were, where they were found. And they sold merchandise to countries all over the world, including Canada, Australia and Japan. And there are plans to expand the range to include cuddly toys and pint glasses. You can tell it's English. Uh, they hope to raise, uh, they hope the, the goat goodies will raise £100,000 by the end of the year. And uh, I think that's absolutely hilarious. Uh, but isn't it funny? Well, it, it, what they did is created art. From the goats did. No, the, they, no. Yeah, someone created art from the video of the goats. Okay. And it's on the shirts now. But I think that's uh, that's brilliant. And every penny they said they raise at the moment is literally cash in the bank that's keeping their nurses on the front line. And uh, as we all know, it's very, very hard work working in a hospice. And I um, I think that's a very creative way. Uh, I think it's absolutely brilliant. We'll put a link up for this, of course, if you want to help them out. I think it's great. Um, since I talked about bees, here's a very interesting thing about bees. When pollen is scarce, bees will stab at plants to speed up flowering. What? Mm-hmm. So, so when it's in short supply, bumblebees damage plant leaves in a way that accelerates flower production. This is what researchers have come up with and reported. Bees are amazing. I know. In some areas of the world, spring has sprung earlier than ever before this year, accompanied by temperatures that are more typical of summertime, and I would agree with that. Um, so... My, they're saying here that plants bloomed very early, mid-April. Ours was even earlier oh, than that. Terrible plants. Um, so you, it was typically three to four weeks early, but for us it was even earlier than that because we're, we're in Vegas and it was just, wow. Good for bees, bad for the dogs. Yes, because they have to stay inside because it's too hot. Allergies. Anyway, these types of seasonal anom- anomalies, anomalies are becoming um, frequent due to climate change and the resulting uncertainty threatens to disrupt the timing of mutualistic relationships between plants and their insect pollinators. They all need each other. Um, on a little side note, we have, a, we have a pair of hummingbirds in our back garden and I found out that hummingbirds like and prefer flowers that are tubular. Because they can get their long, get their long beaks, beaks, beaks in, there. in there. Yeah. Uh, so the researchers discovered um, that uh, one... Uh, peculiar bumblebee behavior may help to overcome such challenges and it by facilitating the coordination between the bees and the plants that they pollinate and uh, they found that the bumblebee workers use their mouth parts mouth parts to pinch into the leaves of plants that haven't yet flowered hmm. and so that results in damage damage which stimulates the production of new flowers that bloom earlier than those on plants that haven't received this nudge how the heck do they know to do that well, it's called nature. It is, and you know, there's perfection in nature, and that's a perfect response. That's, that's your motto. It is. Um, so, but there have, has been some previous work that shows that various kinds of stress can induce plants to flower. Hmm. The role of the bee inflicted damage is accelerating flower production, and was quite unexpected. And uh, it was Professor Mark Mesher. Um, who's in the Environmental System Sciences Department at ETH Zurich that uh, is commenting on this. But they first noticed this behavior uh, during other experiments by one of the other authors and um, pollinators were biting the leaves of test plants in the greenhouse. And they took a further look and did a bit more investigating and they found that others had also observed these behaviors, but uh, no one had really explored what they were doing exactly to the plants. Um, or even reported on the effect of the flower production. Uh, and following these observations, which I would have been so excited about that, to realize, well, what the heck are they doing? Um, they devised several new lab experiments and uh, did some outdoor studies, and they used commercially available bumblebee colonies 
uh, they're the ones that are usually sold for pollination of agricultural crops and, um, and a variety of plants. So they studied and uh, they were able to show that the bumblebees' uh, propensity to damage leaves had a very strong correlation with the amount of pollen they can obtain. And uh, bees damage leaves much more frequently when there is little or no pollen available to them. So they also found that this damage that they inflicted on plants... What are you doing? What is, what's going on? My dogs need... I don't know if I need to let them out of let the them, studio. Let or them out. It's fine. It's fine. I can just hear their toenails tippy-tippy-tap-tap. Um, where was I? Uh, oh, yeah. So it has a um, dramatic effect on flowering time in two different plant species. So tomato plants uh, that were subjected to the bumblebee nibbling, <laughs> they flowered up to 30 days earlier than those that weren't targeted. Uh, but mustard plants flowered 14 days earlier when bees damaged them. Amazing. Anyway, it's uh, quite an influence, they said, on flowering of plants. Uh, one that's never been seen and described before. And um, they think it's possible... You know, the de developmental stage of the plant when bumblebees bite it may influence the degree to which the flowering accelerates. A factor the investigators plan to explore in the future. What, what I found this year, we flowered very early. My blooms on my roses were the biggest I had ever seen them. Is that because all the desert blooms had a very unusual year and there was lots of more pollen? I really don't know because they were as big as my hand. They were as big, and I'd never had blooms on those rose bushes that big. And I couldn't quite understand it myself because we the only thing I knew was that we were, you know, blooming early. <laughs> we were blooming early. Um, but isn't that interesting? Anyway, they tried to manually replicate the damage patterns caused by the bees to see if they could reproduce this effect on the flowers. Um, and they said, while the manipulation did lead to somewhat earlier flowering in both plant species, the effect was not nearly as strong as when the bees did it themselves. So it suggests that some chemical or other cue may be involved. Um, and they say either that or a manual imitation of the damage wasn't accurate enough. Uh, so they're trying to identify the precise cues res uh, responsible for inducing flowering and characteristic character characterizing <laughs> the molecular me mechanisms involved in the plant, respo plant response to bee damage. Um, they also said that they observed the bees' damaging behavior under more natural conditions. So, you know, they, they uh, did some studies upon rooftops in buildings uh, in Zurich, in central Zurich. And in these experiments, the researchers again observed that the uh, bumblebees the, who didn't have enough pollen uh, frequently damaged the leaves of non-blooming plants. But the damaging behavior was consistently reduced when the researchers made more flowers available to the bees. It's so I find this so incredibly interesting. Furthermore, it wasn't only captive bred bumblebees that did this. Uh, they also saw that wild bees from at least two other bumblebee species were nibbling away on these plants in the experimental pl uh, plots. Um, other pollinating insects, it says, such as bees, honeybees, uh, did not exhibit such behavior. However, they seemed to ignore the non-flowering plants entirely, despite being frequent visitors in nearby patches of flowering plants. Um, so they just may, bumblebees may have just found this effective method of mitigating local shortages, they said, of pollen. Um, they said their open fields are abuzz with other pollinators too, which may also benefit from the bumblebee's efforts. Yeah, that bee is paving the way for all the other, <laughs> all the other little pollinators. Uh, but they say it remains to be seen whether this me mechanism is sufficient to overcome the challenges of changing climate. So, um, you know... Insects and plants have this amazing relationship. They've evolved together. They've shared a long, long history. Uh, they do strike a, a delicate balance between, um, you know, the uh, ooh, efflorescence and pollinator development. The bees hold the keys. The bees hold the keys. We all know this. So uh, uh, this is also there could be some, you know, environmental changes that could be disrupting the timing um, and other ecologically important interactions among species. But uh, it said uh, this rapid change in environment could result in insects and plants becoming increasingly out of sync in their development, and that's something from which both sides stand to lose. Um, and that study was in the uh, journal Science. If you want to look that up, we should find you a link and pop that in the show notes as well. See, another good reason to love bees. They're very self-sufficient. Well, on that note, shall we take a quick break, Jim? We can do. Because when we come back, 
we're going to talk about uh, a sniff test, actually, <laughs> and uh, foxes. So you're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio with me, Sam, your host, the Queen of Rock and Roll Dogs, and we'll be right back. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. She's a purebred, orange and white, Brittany. But when we adopted April, she started scratching like crazy. I said, what you put into a dog is what you get out. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. So we had a huge scoop of Dynavite in her bowl. She looked it clean. She loved it. Her coat is now soft. It's silky. Dynavite is nutrition. You get some Dynavite. How happy your dog will be. A Dynavite. She's little Miss Hollywood. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Radio. <laughs> Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Welcome back, everyone. Every, 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 everyone. <laughs> I'm like Max Headroom there. I was I, I, like a glitch. Yeah. I was on a glitch. If you are just listening into the show, you're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. And I'm Sam. I'm your host. And uh, we talk about all things pets, people, and pop culture. Not just pets, actually. We've 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 branched off to any animal and insect that we can possibly talk about. Now, one one um, one uh, page I like to follow on Facebook is the Reisner Veterinary Services. I love what they post, and they do have a bit of a Saturday pet peeve, which always makes me laugh because it's usually my pet peeve as well. But they um, they wanted to talk about their Saturday pet peeve, and it was the sniff test. Uh, using the sniff test to test friendliness in unfamiliar dogs. So this is what they wrote. Recently, a father blogged about an incident in which his 10-year-old son was bitten on the face by a stranger's dog. He and his son were hiking on a trail when they encountered another hiker with a leashed dog. Um, Oliver asked to pet the dog, and the owner suggested the sniff test. The dog licked his hand, so he petted the dog, and it lunged, and it ended up lacerating his eyebrow. Any dog who isn't doing a slobbery, uncoordinated, full-body wag dance when encountering a stranger might be ambivalent, socially reserved, worried, or anxious. Actually, to be safest, safest, let's include the slobbery wag dancers too. Why? And they said... Dogs do not necessarily want to be touched by strangers, and that's very true, any more than kids or, or ourselves want to be touched by strangers. It's a little, quite an invasion of privacy. Not privacy, well, space, your, your personal space. Um, inviting a dog to sniff your hand by standing still, staring, and reaching towards it might be perceived as a threat, and I totally see that. Um, uh, so towards the dog, uh, which, which the dog might respond by avoiding your hand or biting you. And if that perception is a possibility, why take a chance? No, not you, worth it. Not worth it. Not worth saying, but my dog's friendly. We never know what's going to happen. Aggression can be silent and quite stiff, which can look a lot like being calm. And bites happen very quickly. Um, in the blink of an eye, a person's injured and the dog is in serious trouble, for which he didn't ask for the trouble. You see, and this, is, this is where it gets tricky. Because it it could 100% be the kid's fault. If the kid gets bit, your dog could end up losing its life. And yeah, all just... the dog did was react to something that was <clears throat> definitely perceived as a threat if it did bite. Yeah. Um, so uh, dogs do choose to sniff people, of course, um, and other dogs and things. And there's a way of exploration and identification. But sniffing is not an invitation to be stroked and patted. You know, so and the back of the hand thing and all of that. No, that does not need to happen. Um, and don't be, don't feel uncomfortable if someone comes up and said, can I pet your dog? You can just say no. You can just say no. Well, we just have that rule of thumb when we go out. Yeah, we do. We our, just, our dogs are on their walk to do their own. Do their thing. Exploring, sniffing, and exercising. I think that also leads into your dog is not anyone's property or their, for their amusement or just to come over and, and just pet your dog, which happens a lot as well. You you must always ask, and then don't be offended when someone says no. Uh, it's for your it's for your own good, and it's for the dog's good as well. So uh, uh, I did like their pet peeve. I particularly like that. Um, they said somehow we've got to rewrite the etiquette of interacting with unfamiliar dogs so that they they aren't put into a terrible position of being trapped in a leash and forced to defend themselves. 
that in itself would reduce dog bites right there. You know, and they say on a hiking trail or a sidewalk, it's nice to smile at, at, at other people and comment on their dogs and children. You might even want to stop for a moment and have a conversation about how clever and good looking they are. Then you and they can move on, all of you feeling enriched by the encounter, but also safe. I agree. Do you know how many times I walk past someone and I go, that's a cute dog. I don't stop and go over and pet it, you know, but if I, if I, we, we were close, I would ask, you know, and if someone said, no, uh, not a problem whatsoever, you've got to be very respectful because it, uh, it, keep, it keeps you safe. It keeps everybody nice and safe. So I thought that was a great, a great example. So it's an old fashioned method that, as we know, doesn't, doesn't always work. And if you don't understand body language, you're not going to know the difference between silent aggression and, and you calm. just never know. I mean, they're just, they're you animals. They're, they could be, they're reactive. You never know from one day to the next if they might change their mind. Yeah. Well, not just that. Say you're, say you're, you're reaching down to try and sniff, uh, the dog sniff you and pet your dog. What if another child runs by, startles that dog? It might just go for, the, for you because some other child ran by and startled it. You know, so yeah, I think it's a matter of respect and safety. It'll work for everyone. Um, you know what? I thought we'd throw some birds into the mix, Jim. Oh, it's very, we had goats, we had bees, <laughs> now we're on birds. I was so disappointed on our Zoom family quiz today. I got nine out of ten for the animals. Yeah, you didn't get perfect. You gonna, missed, which one did you miss? The, the llama. Well, it missed, I put llama, but it was an alpaca, and at first I was like, alpaca, llama. Now I've got to really look at what the difference I'm, is. I'm going to look at the differences right now. I was, I was on a downer because I got nine out of ten. <laughs> What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Right, so this happens a lot. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, I found a little bird and it was dead on my back patio. And I thought maybe it's hit the window and I couldn't see anything on the window. And I felt terrible. I felt terrible. It had not been attacked or bitten or anything like that. So I thought, oh my gosh, it's probably hit itself on the on the window. Um, but what do you do if you do find one and it's stunned? You know, unfortunately, the one I found was, it passed away. It was really sad. It was the cutest little thing. Anyway, so what can you do? What can you do? This is what they need. Think about if you hit your head on a window. You've got to give them some time to rest and heal. Well, yeah? Hit my head a few times. <laughs> so um, they say for the most part, birds that do hit a window aren't seriously injured. Uh, but they are stunned and they do need some time to recover and, you know, their poor senses. But this is what you can do. You can very gently place the bird in a small box with a dry washcloth or a bit of fabric on the bottom um, so they don't slip and fall. So that gives them a little bit of traction and make sure there are some air holes. And you can um, close the box uh, with the bird in it and put it in the dark. It's nice and quiet and leave it there for a little while. You know, it can be up to two hours. You know, obviously you're going to check on it. Um, and then you can take, after a couple of hours, you can take the bird outside and out of the box. Wait 15 minutes to see if the bird flies off. Yeah, just needs some time to, you know, relax. And if the bird does not fly off, um, then what you do need to call is call a veterinarian who specializes in birds or a bird rehabber. Um and if you can't take your bird inside, the bird inside, then you can wait four hours to see if the bird flies off. Um, you, you know, you would have it outside. Uh, here's, a, here's a good tip. Place window decals on your windows to prevent, prevent this behavior, which I do need to do, do. I felt terrible. I felt terrible about that situation. It was really, oh, I just thought that didn't need to happen. Did you check up on oh, the... My, I just, yeah, I just, hang on a second. Alpaca versus llama. Llamas have long banana shaped ears. Oh, yeah. While alpacas have straight ears ah. and they are smaller. Ah. Their faces are also a bit different, with llamas having a longer face. And they. they while an alpaca's face looks droop, smushed. A bit more droopy, yeah. <coughs> now we know. Banana ears for a llama. Llamas, Banana llama. <laughs> llamas are bigger than alpacas. Oh, okay. By how much? Well, they can weigh up to 400 pounds. Whoa. Wait, here's a picture. Here's an alpaca versus a llama. Oh, well, it's kind of hard to tell the difference. I know. A llama looks like a big, gigantic kangaroo, though. Yeah, it face. does. It does, honestly. And an alpaca looks more like a, a sheep. Yeah, it does. Is that and right? I got it wrong. Yeah, you did. 
What got it? Which is the one that spits on you? Camels. Oh. Do I? But no, I think alpacas do as well, don't they? I don't know. You can't have an alpaca or a llama. <laughs> if they had miniature ones, I'd have one. Where? In the house. Along so. with a miniature donkey and a little goat. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love how goats move. The, I people love know it. we have friends that let their emus in the house. Yeah, I have a friend who's got an emu. Uh, a very large emu. She res- she rescued her. Uh, she was in a, in a bad situation. And uh, she just joined the rest of all the critters over there. The chickens, doves, you name it, they've got it. And it's and they've got a huge property. And they're in the house all the time. The chickens come in, have dinner in the kitchen. <laughs> it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well, let's throw another animal into the mix there, Jim. Oh, my word. It's like the animal soup show. It is. It's like everything but the kitchen sink. Everything but the kitchen sink. Yeah, exactly, Jim. Foxes. I love foxes. I think they're some of my favorite animals. They're so beautiful. They're like just regular domestic dogs. They just like to have fun. Well, that's my article here. It's uh, They are becoming more similar to domesticated dogs as they adapt to their environment. I do know a lot of people who have them in back in England who have rehabbed them um, and then they've remained pets. Um, but urban red foxes, they're becoming very similar, they said, to domesticated dogs as they start to adapt to city environments as well. And this was a whole new analysis that, that happened. And it was a team that was led by Dr. Kevin Parsons of the University of Glasgow's Institute of Biodiversity, Animal Health and Comparative Medicine. And he carried out this analysis into the differences between urban and rural red foxes in, in the UK. Now, there's this great show called Nature Watch in England. And once a year, they ask you to count the wildlife that you see in and out of your garden. And an insane amount of people throughout the whole country participated in it. But it helps, it helps them understand what wildlife do we have? How much do we have? Are we seeing anything new? Which we've seen some new birds since Corona's lockdown. Well, you've been paying attention more to birds this year. Yes, I have. I, the sound of them in the morning is amazing. I should try and record them. We've got little yellow finches, we've got doves, we've got hummingbirds, we've got roadrunners and quail. We've got these black and white birds, we don't know what they are. They're not pigeons. We've got pigeons. And we've got... Blackbirds, starlings. And we've got... Even American red robins. Yeah, and then we've got a very large bird with a very yellow chest, um, and I forgot the name of it, but it's it's it is regional. It's uh, what's the word? It's local to this it's region. It's local to this regional <laughs> region, <laughs> but it's quite big. And so since since this lockdown, we've just seen so much more nature. Owls. We have big a big owl we see every once in a while at yeah. night. Yeah, we had a ground owl at one point, didn't we? And a big horned owl, a great horned owl. Yeah, and when we do our walks, we've seen some big... Mm-hmm. What's the one with the big... We've seen red, red-tailed hawk and falcons and... Yeah. So I think everybody could... And we've seen, of course, rabbits and stuff like that. I think everybody can agree they've probably seen a lot more wildlife out there, which I think is wonderful and of course we've had much cleaner skies and air which is fantastic and uh, and so yeah so they've been been uh we went on a little bit of a side road there but they've been um checking out the difference between urban and these rural foxes and um they still they say they've got some way to go to explain how dogs could have evolved into into our current pets but um with this current lockdown they said due to COVID-19 um we're seeing them a lot more frequently in the cities, like the goats showing up because there's less and less people about. And it's been known for some time that cities create new habitats for wild populations. Um, many can't cope, and it's recognized that some types of animals are are especially good at living within city limits. Um, red foxes uh, are prevalent within several cities within the UK and elsewhere where they've become well-established. And um, they were wondering whether the change in lifestyle was related to adaptive differences between urban and rural populations. And they they basically assessed their skulls, the skulls from hundreds of foxes found within London and surrounding countryside, and saw that urban foxes had a smaller brain size capacity, but also a different snout shape that would help them forage within urban 
habitats. This is so fascinating. Um, and there was also less of a difference between males and females in the urban foxes. And that's what Dr. Parsons has been working on. They said that the changes matched up with what would be expected during a domestication process. So in other words, uh, while urban foxes are, are not domesticated, they are changing in ways that move them closer to what seems to be a domesticated animal. And they say I've seen lots of people with pets, and they're, oh my gosh, they're lovely. They're lovely. Um, they say it's important because human-animal human interaction uh, interactions are continuous. And some of the basic environmental aspects that may have occurred during the initial phases of domestication for our current pets, like dogs and cats, were probably similar to conditions in which urban foxes and other urban animals are living today. So we could be witnessing this amazing, you know, step into domestication. Um, and they say adapting to life around humans actually primes some animals for that. And... Um, that's pretty exciting. Now, the researchers of uh, the University of Bristol, Edinburgh, and Massachusetts, and the National Museums Scotland, then decided to test whether differences found between the urban and the rural foxes, and these are the red foxes, had any similarity to what is found across different species of foxes. And uh, they said this could this could tell us whether the the um, evolution of urban rural differences was completely unique or something that has potentially happened before. And it turned out that uh, the the way urban and rural foxes differed matched up with a pattern of fox evolution um, that occurred over millions of years between species. Hmm. Mm. And while the amount of change isn't huge, not huge, you know, it it showed up that this recent change in foxes is dependent upon deep seated tendencies for how foxes can change. In other words, these changes were not caused by random mutations having random effects the way many might think uh, evol uh, evol uh, evolution occurs. Do you say evolution or evolution? Evolution. So it's evolution for me then. Anyway, <laughs> the Doom's research paper, Skull Morphology, uh, diverges between urban and rural populations of red foxes, mirroring patterns of domestication and macro evolution. It is published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society Series B. Aren't the Russians experts in fox domestication? And, and I don't know. They're, it's a common pet now in the Russian world. I didn't know that. I, I have no I idea. I remember reading an article years ago about that. That like the people that, well, they, the unfortunate fur trade, and they morphed from the fur trade into turning them into domesticated ah. animals and pets and trying to change people's minds. Oh, I see. Um Here's an account you should follow on Instagram, Graham. Juniper the Fox. You're going to fall in love with Juniper the Fox. Is that the one that's funny colored? No. Well, what funny colored fox are you Like talking? it was like a blue and a iridescent color. No, let me, uh, I'm going to show you that. Just bear with me one second, everybody. We just make sure that that account name is correct. I love the name Juniper. Oh, I just think it's so fitting. Oh, it's Juniper Fox, two X's. Juniper, f mm. no, no. Yes, it is, yes, it is, yes, it is. Juniper Fox with two X's, and the that's on Instagram. And the actual website is juniperfox.com with two X's. Look at Juniper. Look at, look at the face. Oh, that's a nice looking fox. So cute. And you know, it's, that picture is, uh, is uh, the comment is irresistible face activated. Treats imminent. I love it. It's so nice to watch. But I think Juniper came in injured. And then I think they brought in a second one. And Juniper's friends with the dog. And Juniper sometimes wears a hat. And sometimes wears a costume to look like a shark. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. They make the most amazing sounds. Amazing. I wonder if there's a little video on here and play it. Let's see if there's some... Let's have a listen. Let me turn this up nice and loud. <laughs> no. That's the two foxes. So that is, <laughs> they call Today on the Real World, Fox Edition. 
Uh, we had a, a, a heated verbal argument between Juni- Juniper and Elmwood. Oh, my God. After Elmwood chased Fig around. And his- somebody just came running into the room. Oh. <laughs> Because of what they just heard. Who came in? Both of them. Both of them. Oh, they lo- like the sound of a fox. Do you want to listen to this fox? Oh, his. I'm getting the stare down. Mr. Twix is. He's been staring at me a lot this past week. Every time not... I look around on the patio, he's staring at me. He's not pleased. What is that, Twix? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh. This is adorable. I think what we need to do is uh, we should do a video. Of Mr. Twix responding to Juniper and El- Elmwood. I think they're beautiful names. So isn't that interesting about foxes, Mr. Jim? Mm, very interesting. Well, I've got another story. <laughs> what animal is involved now? It's a dog. It's a dog. Here's another reason to love dogs. I mean, there are many reasons. I don't think we'll ever... Go- we'll never run out of reasons to love dogs, will we? I don't think so. I mean, I'm loving Mr. Twix right now because he's, he is like, like, like he's got some static electricity in them. Which reminds me, by the way, everyone, I'm, I'm halfway to being a groomer <laughs> in my own mind. But during this lockdown, our groomers couldn't be open. So I did have some grooming scissors. And Mr. Twix has now gotten used to me, uh, got used to me. Oh, he was always okay with me brushing him. If I say, what, do you want me to brush you? He would. He runs and gets on the yoga mat with me outside. It's cute. But he's got used to me trimming his ears, trimming his paws. That was a challenge. But now he's good with that. I do his tail for him. I do, uh, now can do his beard. Only just. Only just. We're getting there. Um, I'm working on the hair above his eyeballs. But... He did get to go to the groomer two weeks ago, and looks like he's going to be groomed again. So I'm going to get some clippers, I think, and we'll we'll tackle the rest of it. It it will save us a heck of a lot of time. I know that because he's usually gone for half a day, and uh, you know save us some money too. And, and another thing we've been doing as well, it's been so warm outside that uh, instead of them them coming in the shower with us, which they normally do, we're just showering them outside, aren't we, with the hose, and it goes very quickly. And they dry in two minutes because we're in the middle of the desert. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I I, uh, I will let you know how I get on when I get the clippers. I say I've mastered the scissors. I cut my own finger one time. <laughs> but I do know you've got to be, I, I mean, I need to, I've, I've got actually a very close friend who's a groomer. But, you know, there's things you've got to be careful of, like the skin underneath their armpits. It's extremely sensitive and thin. You could easily cut that. So uh, I'm not just going to go willy-nilly in there. Um I'm going to to study up on that. Um, So let's get on to another reason to love dogs. Man wakes from coma after his dog visits the hospital. And they said this little pup uh, has been named the miracle dog after he woke up his owner from a medically induced coma. And while waiting for him to come out of a coma, um, Andy's wife, Estelle, received special permission to bring Teddy to the hospital. And pet visits usually take place outside of the hospital, but the staff made this exception for for Teddy. And uh, it was reported that Andy woke up from his coma as soon as Teddy entered the hospital room and started barking. Isn't that amazing? That's cool. So they said he's a remarkable little dog in many ways, and he's clever and loving and loyal, funny, and he's a right little character. Now, the senior sister um, on the um, ICU... She told um, uh, one of the news outlets that having pets around during recovery can be incredibly beneficial for patients, their friends and families, and for the hospital staff as well. Um, It can be motivational, aiding recovery, and can provide a pleasant and familiar experience in what can otherwise prove to be a long, uncomfortable journey in hospital. Oh, and I so agree with that. Um, And they said, um, for helping uh, wake up Andy... Teddy was recognized by the UK's Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the RSPCA. And it's the same organization in which Andy adopted him from. And uh, under a uh, a very, you know, so he was honored under this very special animal category. And he's the only animal to win an award under the newly created category. Reason 10,562 to love dogs. Mm. (laughs) Wow. 
Yeah, when you think about it, if you're stressed, you know, you come home from work or whatever, and you get home, and there's your pet, you're like, oh, I just feel better. It's just an instant tonic, instant tonic. And so I do have lots of friends who have therapy dogs that go into hospitals and hospice and, um, you know, therapy places and care homes and all all different kinds of scenarios, um, emergency situations and disasters and stuff. And... Um, it truly does help people. It often helps people who are victims that, that you need to get information from them, but they seem to be quite traumatized and closed up. But once you bring an animal into the scene, they relax and they open up more and you can get more information from them. And uh, I'm so glad that lots of people put their dogs through therapy training. People don't, a lot of people don't value them as much as they should, but the, they do make a big difference. And in Teddy's case, he woke him up from a coma. Yeah, dogs that are trained to be around strangers and other people versus like the earlier dogs we talked about when people go, can I pet your dog? Well, like a therapy dog is trained to understand strangers and most pets aren't. Yeah, but there's still a level of permission. Yeah. It's still not a free-for-all. Yeah, like they're working. Yeah, because... Mm -hmm. You know, that dog is not your dog. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, think that's a, I think that's a great story. And I think considering what we've all been going through and some people are still continuing to go through, depending on where you live, uh, with this uh, coronavirus, it's nice to hear some good news, isn't it? Yeah. It's nice to have some good news stories. And don't be scared to share those good news stories. You're not diminishing what people are going through. But everybody needs uh, a little uh, levity. And um, and laughter, I would definitely say laughter as well. So, uh, you know, don't stifle yourself. It's been a very stressful time for lots of people. I think it's been great for the pets. <laughs> and it's been great for shelter pets because lots of people have adopted and lots of people have fostered. And it's not very often you see a shelter empty. And that just, for me, is the goal. That is always the goal. So, um, yeah, we're going to finish on that lovely high note um, of being woken up from a coma by your dog. Amazing. And Teddy certainly deserves that rec re recognition as well. Well, if you have liked today's show, it's gone rather fast, wouldn't you say, Jim? It has. It's gone super fast. If you liked today, today's show, and especially if you're listening on your smartphone, there's an option where you can share the show directly to your social media networks, tell your friends and family about the show, and... Uh, you know, let's get the word out there. I don't know what our t anniversary is now. Are we on our 10th year, 9th year? I can't even remember, Jim. It's all a blur right I'll have now. to go back into the archives and see. I think we're coming up on a 10-year anniversary at some point this year. But you know what? It's the weirdest year ever, isn't it? So <laughs> you'll have to forgive us for not remembering. <laughs> I don't know why I don't know why I I you know used a planner this year because it was completely unnecessary. <laughs> oh my goodness. And you know what? I, I think we should all apologize to 2019 because everybody kept saying, Good riddance, 2019. Mm. I did the same thing and then oh I'll have it back. I feel, yeah, I feel so bad. I'd be so mean to 2019. <laughs> so uh, remember, everyone, you can help an animal in need. Either rescue, adopt, donate, volunteer, or share their information. Rescue your next family member and replace the word shop with adopt. And uh, always be kind to all the animals and the insects. <laughs> That's a really important thing, especially the bees. We need them. Uh, thank you, Jim, for... Uh, for um, engineering the show. Very well. And being my co-host, my other two co-hosts, I don't know where, did they just leave? One's here sleeping, the other one's in the other room on her chair. Because they normally just, you know, hang out in the studio, we just say showtime, they come running in. And uh, would you please take a moment to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and don't forget to post pictures of your pets. We love to see your fur babies. Don't forget to tell us their names. Um, and feel free to do that, especially on our Facebook page. Again, thank you, Jim. Thank you to my two little cheeky dogs. <laughs> and you've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio, where it's all about pets, people, and pop culture. I'm your host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. And always kiss your pets good morning and good night. And I'll see you next time you've been listening to vegas rock dog radio pets people pop culture you've been listening to vegas rock dog radio pets people pop culture 
Visit Vegas Rock Dog Radio for more information. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe on iTunes and iHeartRadio. And remember, give your fur babies a big kiss from me, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. You must not rely on the information in this broadcast from our hosts as an alternative to medical advice from your veterinarian. If you have any specific questions about a medical matter regarding your pets, you should consult your veterinarian or specialist. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.